Okay, so today what we're going to do is talk about The Ethics of Belief by W.K. Clifford. W.K. Clifford was a uh, prominent mathematician and philosopher who lived in uh, the 1800s, completely 1800s. He died young in England. He, as I say, mathematician and, and philosopher. He was very much concerned with uh, belief, the subject of belief, and he believed that very often people believe irresponsibly. What does believing irresponsibly mean? According to Clifford, you believe irresponsibly when you uh, believe something for reasons other than sufficient evidence. So if you believe something because it's comforting, if you believe something uh, for any reason other than you have sufficient evidence for believing, then you're acting and believing irresponsibly. See? And so his position was that in order for us to maintain civilization, what we need to do is to encourage more and more people to believe responsibly. He rejected the belief uh, that uh, all that matters will be your actions and you can believe however you like that that's a purely personal matter. He says that's not true. He says, why? Because beliefs, he said, typically issue in action, either either shortly after someone holds a belief or if the next day or the day after, but ultimately, and more often than not, he says beliefs produce actions. And if someone believes too quickly without sufficient evidence, then the person is more likely to believe erroneously, to believe falsely. Furthermore, the person is more likely to uh, fall into prejudice or superstition or fraud. The person could end up more easily being defrauded if the person is gullible and believes too quickly. Okay, And he says that all of us have a moral and social responsibility to believe only according to the evidence. If the evidence is strong and clear-cut, then we can have a strong belief. We should proportion, he says, the strength of our uh, beliefs and convictions to the strength of the evidence. If, there is, if the evidence is there's an 80% chance that it will rain somewhere in our area, then we should believe it's probably going to rain, but it may not. But it may not rain. Okay, so I think that's very important for us to understand. Now, what I want to say furthermore is that according to him, uh, he says that uh, the people who want to believe because they say it's just their business, it's a purely personal matter, he says are, are wrong. He says because, because beliefs can in fact influence other people be through our actions, Believing should never be regarded as a purely personal, private matter, but always as potentially social and public. And so, uh, and he says, the more people get used to believing without sufficient evidence, the the more they will find it harder to determine what is the truth. And think of, it, he didn't use this expression, but think of the idea of a, an intellectual immune system. Uh, if you get into the habit he seems to be saying, of believing without sufficient evidence and believing, let's say, because something's comforting, then it'll be more and more difficult for you even to determine what is in fact true. And then people around you will, will value uh, evidence and the truth uh, less than they should as well. And then you could be more likely to fall victim to prejudice or superstition or fraud, and he says, or tyranny. If more and more people believe the promises of some charismatic political figure, such as Hitler, then you could have tyranny. And so this is that's his position. And you might wonder, is, he, is it just mainly that he's concerned about religion? Well, he was agnostic, so he didn't have a, a affirmative, affirmative belief in God, but he didn't say he definitely thought that God didn't exist, but he thought that matters of religion go beyond evidence and sufficient evidence. Uh, but it's not just religion. He thought there were a lot of areas of our lives when people just believe because something's comforting. And his thesis was that it is always morally and socially unacceptable 
to believe anything without sufficient evidence. Right? So for him, it's always wrong to take a leap of faith. Always wrong to take a leap of faith. Now I want you to know that. Okay. Now, what's going to happen? Now think about, uh, for example, there was a group of people. Some people actually, a lot of people said it was a cult. There was a there were a group of people uh, many years ago uh, in uh, in California. And they had, they had, this group had members who had been members of the group for several years. And then some people had fallen away from the group. But the hardcore believer, believers were, uh, continued to remain in the group. And it turned out that the, the members of the group ended up committing suicide. And you go, well, why? Well, it's because the guy running the group, a guy named Applewhite, who, by the way, had cancer, uh, told people that if they do everything he f said, uh, that they would in fact be able to enter this spaceship at the tail of the hale -Bopp comet. And there was no evidence really he had for that, but apparently the people over the many years were conditioned to accept this guy's thinking. And in fact, the people had to wear certain clothes, had to prepare food in a certain way, had to cer have a certain number of quarters in their pockets, had to have certain shoes like Nikes. Uh, they had Their lives were highly regimented. Many people like regimentation. Others, of course, rebel. But these people like that structure and regimentation. And ultimately, they believed that they would, uh, in a sense, survive, if you like, their bodily deaths. But they had to remove their containers, that is, their bodies. And, and they ended up, uh, many of them, well, they, they killed themselves, and especially by poison. Okay? And they even left videos to explain why they did why they, what they did. So uh, that's an extreme case. But the point is, and Clifford would say this, that believing without sufficient evidence can get people into trouble. It can be they can harm themselves or they can harm other people. If someone is prejudiced against a whole group of people and the person has uncritically accepted the prejudice as from the person's parents, then that person could end up mistreating other people from that group. And then that person may not give them a job, for example, because of that person's prejudice. Right? And that person, uh, because of the prejudice, will end up going out of his or her way to, to notice something negative about some particular group and, and then uh, ignore or discount whatever is positive about some members of that group. And so you can understand how disregarding evidence and believing because someone wants to believe can result in a lot of negativity, prejudice and superstition. Um, and uh, fraud. Someone could be more likely uh, to be a victim of fraud if the person believes without sufficient evidence. This was, these were very uh, were concerns, obviously, of Clifford. And Clifford maintained that as, so long as we proportion the strength of our conviction to the strength of the evidence, we can make the world a better place. It doesn't mean we will infallibly believe what is true, but we're more likely to believe what is true. Sometimes <coughs> you'll believe things that are false. You know, if you if you follow evidence and you've always liked uh, Wendy's, uh, the restaurant, and you always get the same thing, iced tea, and you've done that a thousand times, it's reasonable for you to believe the thousand first time that you'll like it. But it's possible that there will be a new recipe. Uh, somebody's trying to dilute the tea to save money. Or somebody, as a practical joke, is putting hot sauce in the tea. Uh, or somebody actually was bleeding into the tea. And the point is, there are lots of things that could happen, such that if they did happen, you wouldn't like the tea, but it would be reasonable to believe that you would in those circumstances. So sometimes when you can follow the evidence and reason, you'll still be mistaken, but you're much less likely to, Clifford would say, uh, if you follow reason and the evidence. And we will have a more civilized society if we condition people, educate people, really, uh, to believe only according to the strength of the evidence. And so if the evidence is strong and clear-cut, we should have a strong conviction. If the evidence is weak, we should have a weak provisional belief. If the evidence is ambiguous, perhaps we should suspend judgment and have not have any definite belief. If we haven't really studied the issue, then we should also have a weak, uh, not a weak belief, but we should suspend judgment and not have any definite belief. Okay, so again, Clifford's central thesis is that we have a moral and social responsibility to believe only according to 
sufficient evidence, only according to sufficient evidence. And he rejected uh, any other basis for belief. His position is called evidentialism for obviously related to the word evidence. Okay, It's not pragmatism. It's not saying that you should believe something because it works well or it feels good or it's uh, convenient. and it, uh, It's not that or that you like the consequences for you, the believer. Um, rather, it's that you have a moral and social responsibility to believe only according to the evidence. Uh, and if you do that, the world will be a better place. And Clifford is constantly, constantly drawing a distinction between what may be comforting to you as an individual believer and then what is in the best interest of your society and the human race. Okay? And I want you to understand that. So he's saying that, you know, some people say all that matters will be your actions. But that's not the case. He says, no, it's your beliefs matter. And he gives this example at the beginning of the essay we're reading. And it's an example of a ship owner. The ship owner leases out his ship for uh, immigrants, for people who want to go set sail for a new country. And the ship owner has evidence to believe the ship may no longer be seaworthy. But instead of uh, trying to investigate that and possibly uh, having to do costly repairs, he talks himself into believing it will be seaworthy. And, and, and he does this through a series of rationalizations. He says, well, Providence or God will take care of these people. These are good people uh, setting sail for a new country. I, the ship hasn't sunk before, and I think everything will probably be okay. okay. And it turns out that things weren't okay, and, and according to this scenario, and the people ended up uh, drowning, and then he collects his insurance, right? Okay, so the point is, he says that, that beliefs have real effects. And here's what he says. He says, even if the people didn't did not uh, did not drown. The fact of the matter is, even if they didn't drown, that the person was irresponsible and not following the evidence. And if you follow the evidence, then you're less likely to have erroneous beliefs and you're less likely to produce bad results. So I want you to understand that. So again, his position is that it is always wrong, unacceptable, to believe anything for it for on the basis of insufficient evidence. No exceptions. None. And I want you to know that. And I want you to know that he had an evidentialist view of of uh, belief. Uh, he felt very strongly about it. Uh, and he said that he goes, think of it this way. Our beliefs can affect not only us and uh, people around us right now, but even future generations. Think of, for example, the Constitution was based, our Constitution was based on beliefs, our laws our traditions, our language. And think of, uh, for example, parents. who they could, uh, ins they could end up making their children prejudiced. So their beliefs, uh, the prejudiced parents, their beliefs could affect <coughs> future generations. So we understand that. Clifford says, believe only according to the evidence. It is always wrong to believe anything, anything without sufficient evidence. What's going to happen is the next assignment is going to be from a very prominent American psychologist and philosopher who argued we are sometimes justified in taking a leap of faith. Uh, and that person was writing in conscious opposition to uh, a good deal of what Clifford was saying. And that person was William James. And that's the next lecture. So William James, again, psychologist, philosopher, was at Harvard for many years. And James is going to say, and I'll get into this for the next lecture, but James is going to say we're sometimes justified in taking a leap of faith. If the evidence is indecisive in one way or the other, and if taking a leap of faith, if there's reason to believe that taking a leap of faith will be make it more likely that we can achieve uh, momentously pri uh, positive results for us as individual believers. You know. And James was one of the first psychologist to talk about self-fulfilling beliefs. Again, I'm going to talk about this uh, next lecture, in the next lecture. But I do want you to understand that Clifford is taking the position that, that beliefs uh, must be held only according to sufficient evidence, and that if you don't have sufficient evidence, you shouldn't have any strong belief, and that it, he rejected any form of leap of faith. And so he rejected, if you like, 
uh, religion because it's interesting because although some people have defended a leap of faith, including uh, William James, the next author for us, uh, both Clifford and James maintain that religion does take a leap of faith, but the difference is uh, that James thought that was sometimes warranted and Clifford thought it was never warranted. Okay, so I do want you to understand that. Clifford's saying if we if we get in the habit of believing without sufficient evidence, we will weaken what, I'll, I'll coin a term, our intellectual immune systems. If we get in the habit of believing without sufficient evidence, we will find it harder to discern the truth. People around us could be less likely to even to care about the truth and evidence around them, around us. And that's what he's saying. He's saying that, that uh, we need to get in the habit of believing according to the evidence uh, and if we fall out of that habit, uh, that we are going to be more likely to believe what's false, more likely to do harmful things to other people. And if more and more people in our society uh, believe without sufficient evidence, we can actually end up having a society that can sink into savagery and into political tyranny. We could have much more fraud, uh, much more superstition, tyranny. Uh, and he says that we can help protect against that if we take responsibility and believe only according to the evidence. And he goes, we as a member of the human race, each of us, has a duty to believe only according to the evidence, regardless of whether we have reason to believe that it's comforting for us as individuals to believe. He goes, no, no, you have to think about what is best for the human race. And what is best for the human race is for us to be educated to believe only according to the evidence. And that's pretty much what I wanted to cover for today.